Have you ever been utterly confident of something and yet it turned out you were completely and totally wrong? Have you ever had that experience or is it just me? Actually happened to me just last week, Lynn and I were having a conversation with some new friends of ours and we were talking about how long we've lived in the area, how long I've been here at this church, how long Lynn's been at Lancaster Mennonite. And I had a number in my mind, a number of years that she'd been there and Lynn had a different number in her mind. And I knew that I was right. So I counted it out on my fingers and did it and established, okay, yes, I'm correct. It's been this many years. And then one of our children spoke up and said, no, actually, mom's right. It's been this many years. And so it turned out I can't do math or even count, do basic <laughs> counting. It's pretty embarrassing to have an opinion that you are completely and totally confident in and to be utterly wrong. But in the grand scheme of things, that's pretty trivial. It doesn't really matter all that much. But there are some people who have opinions that are wrong in sort of historic proportion. They are just epically and completely wrong. There were a whole bunch of people about 200, 250 years ago who were completely wrong about something. And there was a young man by the name of Isaac Watts who had started composing some new songs, some new hymns. You would know many of these hymns. He wrote hymns like, uh, Come Ye That Love the Lord, or We're Marching to Zion, that's a Watts hymn. Uh, when I Survey the Wondrous Cross, I Sing the Mighty Power of God, or a famous song this time of year, Joy to the World. Watts wrote all of these. And there were a lot of people who were really, really confident that Watts was making a mistake by writing these hymns. Because they already had a perfectly good songbook. It was called the Psalter, and it was a collection of psalms translated into English and set to a common meter. And that was the only songs that were sung in much of the Protestant world. This was certainly true where Calvin, John Calvin, had significant influence. And it was certainly true of the Church of England where Watts was writing. And so Watts was writing these songs, uh, creating new compositions to praise and glorify God. And there were people who were deeply convinced in their bones that Watts was making a mistake. We have record of one man, a pastor by the name of Adam Rankin, who rode on horseback from Kentucky to Philadelphia to join the first convention of Presbyterians here on this continent, and Rangan's primary motivation for making this 600-mile journey on horseback was to argue against the adoption of Watts' songs. He said to the assembly, I have come here to argue against what he called a grave and pernicious error of singing songs like, I sing the mighty power of God or joy to the world. This dude was seriously, seriously wrong, utterly confident of his opinion, so confident that he would ride on horseback 600 miles, but completely and totally wrong. Wrong in historic proportions. It's almost 250 years later, and I can still stand up here and dunk on this guy because he was that wrong. It's embarrassing to be completely and totally convinced of something and have it turn out not to be the case. Can I tell you another embarrassing belief that I have? I believe that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Now that probably doesn't sound that embarrassing here in this context. A Christian pastor in a Christian church on a Sunday the day after Christmas reciting words of a classic Christian formulation of belief, the Nicene Creed. I believe that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Does not sound very embarrassing. But take it out of this context and set it into your normal life, whether you go back to work tomorrow or next week, show up into the office and find a coworker and say, hey, do you know what I think? I think that a guy who lived and died 2,000 years ago is going to reappear one day and take charge of everything and judge all the people who have ever lived and died. That's what I think is going to happen sometime in the future. It sounds kind of embarrassing when you put it that way. And I guess in some ways the jury is still out, right? We don't know, in the sense of having a declared definitive fact, whether Jesus will indeed come again to judge the living and the dead. And so to believe it is not necessarily presently embarrassing, but it holds forth the possibility of future embarrassment. To believe that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. But in fact, that's what the song Joy to the World is about. If you find it in your hymnal, it's somewhere in the 300s, I think, in our blue hymnal. It's not in the Christmas section. Watts did not write it as a Christmas song. Watts was not uh, thinking back to the birth of Christ into the world 2,000 years ago when Watts was writing some 1,700 years earlier. Watts was looking ahead, thinking not about the first coming of Christ, but about the second coming of Christ. 
This is what Watts had in mind, and he actually was drawing from a psalm. He was drawing from Psalm 98, and sort of like what Eugene Peterson did with his translation of the message, Watts was trying to distill down the essence of Psalm 98 into the contemporary common vernacular. And so he penned this coronation hymn, envisioning the day that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. This is what Watts was thinking about when he penned Joy to the World. But we reduce it down to a Christmas song. And imagine that it's about something that happened 2,000 years ago, something that is settled historic fact. By and large, we don't tend to think that much about the second coming of Jesus. Certainly not this time of year. This time of year is all about the first coming of Jesus. We can sort of domesticate that scene and make sense of it and reflect on it and commemorate on it. And so we call this season leading up to Christmas, the season of the church life that we just came out of, we call it Advent. And we think that Advent means preparing for the first coming of Jesus, preparing to recognize something that already happened. But in reality, Advent is about the future coming of Jesus. Advent, it's from a Latin word, adventus, that means arrival or presence. And it's anticipating when, as the creed says, Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Advent is not primarily about preparing for Christmas. Advent is about preparing for the second coming. You can actually see this in the candles. We have a tendency to call these, uh, by traditional names, these candles symbolize different themes that we see in the Christmas story. Hope, peace, joy, love, or hope, love, joy, peace. That's what we tend to think these candles symbolize. That's what they stand for. But traditionally, as the Advent tradition emerges sometime in maybe the fifth or sixth century, these candles had different meanings, or the four Sundays of Advent had different meanings. Advent was about what was called the four final things. And so the candles, if they had candles, the Sundays would have stood for, are you ready for this? Death, judgment, heaven, hell. Traditionally, these are the candles of Advent, the Sundays of Advent. Can you imagine trying to do that today? There's a little girl who's going to participate in the Advent candle lighting for the first time, and she's like, which candle do I get to light? You're like, well, Susie, this is the candle for hell. (laughs) I don't know that it would work real well to go back to that traditional understanding. But I do think there's value in trying to reframe an understanding of Advent, and not just Advent, but Christmas, as anticipating the second coming of Christ. This potentially embarrassing belief that's enshrined in the Nicene Creed that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. To anticipate that coming and to connect it to the Christmas story and to connect it to how we live our own lives. Because to be honest, I'm not sure how much we really need to prepare ourselves for Christmas. If there's one thing that popular culture teaches us this time of year, it is that literally nothing can stop Christmas from coming. A furry green monster who shows up and steals all the decor cannot stop Christmas from coming. Abandoning your child at home as you set off on your family's Parisian vacation cannot stop Christmas from coming. The Bumpus' dogs coming in and eating your Christmas turkey cannot stop Christmas from coming. You can just go get some Chinese food. Even a gang of international terrorists taking over Nakatomi Plaza on Christmas Eve cannot stop Christmas from coming. The pop culture message is Christmas will come no matter what. And historically, this is true. What we celebrate on Christmas is an event of the past. It is history. Jesus Christ has come into the world. This has happened. But Christian faith is not only oriented toward remembering what happened in the past, Christian faith is also oriented toward anticipating what we believe will happen in the future. And so maybe as we move out of this season of preparing for the day of Christmas to commemorate something that already happened, perhaps there's a new opportunity for a season of preparation, for a season to envision what it might mean to fully believe this potentially embarrassing possibility that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. Now, I don't believe in the like 10 or 15 minutes I have left with you this morning that I can persuade you that this is a definite certainty. 
If you, like most of us, have been raised in the modern, becoming postmodern era with all of the beliefs and presuppositions of the Enlightenment foisted upon us, we know that dead people stay dead and the true rulers of power occupy halls of grandeur, not little stables. We know these things deep in our bones. And so I can't change those beliefs for you in the next 10 or 15 minutes. If you hear this claim that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and your response is skepticism, I don't know that I can totally shift that this morning. But perhaps we can make some space. Perhaps we can carve out a realm of possibility where we are open to believing this potentially embarrassing claim about the second coming, the return of Jesus Christ. Perhaps we can open up this space by holding together some things that traditionally are separated, or that certainly our enlightened modern minds separate. And by holding these things together, perhaps we'll be more faithful to the biblical story and create space for the possibility, the possibility to believe and even to anticipate Christ's return. And maybe it starts by thinking about this concept of joy and holding it together with judgment. Judgment and joy are not things we typically tend to associate with one another, and we think about the second coming or Christ's return as a time of judgment. We sometimes even will refer to it as judgment day. And that has a certain note of heaviness, a certain note of perhaps even condemnation. Judgment day, we assume, is something that's bad. It won't be a day of rejoicing or celebration. It will be a day of punishment and sorrow and grief and suffering. Christ is coming to judge. How can that be joyful? But Watts, when he reflected on the 98th Psalm and composed this hymn that we sing now in English, uh, Watts anticipates this as a day of joy, as did the psalmist. That the arrival of God into the world, the arrival of Christ back into the world to judge the living and the dead is a matter of celebration. Judgment does not have to be disconnected from joy. Judgment is actually something all of us, at some level, eagerly long for. Now, you may not think of yourself as a judgmental person. I hope that you're not. Jesus himself warned us against the dangers of judging, saying that the way that we judge others is the way we ourselves will be judged. And so it's not good to cultivate an attitude, a spirit of judgmentalism. But as we go about our lives, all of us encounter situations that desperately call out for judgment. Whenever we confront something that we recognize as an injustice, whenever we bump into something, we say, someone ought to do something about this. This isn't right. What we're really yearning for is we're yearning for judgment. We're yearning for someone who has authority and power to enter into the situation and to declare not only this is wrong, but to usher in a solution to make it right. And this is what the hope of the second coming promises, that Jesus will come again, not just with the capacity to judge in the sense of determining what is wrong, but that Jesus will come fully with power to establish and enact what is right. And in all of these situations of injustice and wrongdoing and brokenness and harm, in all of these situations, wherever we survey the world and recognize something is not right here, what we are longing for is judgment. And if Jesus is able to come and judge, then that possibility should fill us with great joy. Because it's not just that Jesus can decree what is wrong, but Jesus can set forth, establish what is wrong right. I actually see this language used a lot in the uh, epistles, the later half of the New Testament, particularly in Paul. Paul talks a lot about God's justice and righteousness and God's justification. And often Paul's working with a pretty narrow set of Greek words that are connected to an even older set of Hebrew words. And what Paul is envisioning is God's capacity to rightify things. It's not a word that exists in English, but it's true to Paul's vocabulary. God's capacity to take what is bent and crooked and broken and to straighten it out and to make it right. And this is the power of Christ's judgment. What we anticipate is that Christ will come and set all things right, and this can fill us with hope and promise and expectation of joy. But it also means holding together the idea of creation and of consummation. 
Often when we think about the return of Christ or we think about death, judgment, heaven, hell, the final four things that the days of Advent used to symbolize, when we think about those things, we tend to imagine destruction, that God is coming into the world in order to destroy it. And there is almost nothing. There are a couple little hints, maybe in Peter and certain interpretations of the book of Revelation that can support that, but there's almost nothing in the New Testament that envisions Christ's return as a day of destruction. It is not that God has come to rebuke creation, to undo creation, to apologize or repent for creation as if making the world of time and space and matter was really ultimately a mistake and God needs to undo all of that and rescue us out of it. It is God coming into the world in the person of Jesus to set right all that exists in the world. Creation was not created to be destroyed nor was creation created simply to be on its own. Creation was created for a purpose, a God-given purpose, and that purpose is consummation, or the joining together of the realm of God, what we would think of as heaven, and the experience of the material world. And so popular conceptions that envision Christ's second coming as a time of ultimate destruction when the earth will be no more and everything will be destroyed, have very little to do with the New Testament or the Old Testament for that matter. Instead, what we see in Revelation is a new heaven and a new earth, an earth prepared by God for creation, a renewed earth that comes into being, but still working with the same basic raw material that God used to create in the first place. And so thinking about anticipating the second coming is not anticipating destruction, devastation, the erasure of all that is, but it's finding that God will finally bring creation to its ultimate and intended purpose. In Romans 8, we see the language of liberation. This is the passage that Nina read for us that we generally would probably not associate with the Christmas season. But Paul writes, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption, not destruction, the redemption of our bodies. And earlier, Paul explains that the creation was subjected to futility or to decay. But there's hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The hope is liberation the liberation of creation. And as N.T. Wright and others have said, you don't liberate something by destroying it. And so if the hope of creation is to be set free from its bondage to decay, then what we are hoping for is a renewal that happens within creation, not the destruction of creation. So faithfully anticipating the second coming means holding together the idea of judgment and joy, that when Christ comes into the world to judge, it is ultimately to make all things right, and that should fill us with joy. It means holding together, not separating out creation and consummation. It's not that we prize creation and value creation, and so we hope the second coming never actually happens, nor is it that we believe the second coming will usher in the destruction of creation, but that at Christ's advent, his second advent, his presence with us, creation will be restored to its full potential, liberated from its bondage to decay. Finally, it means holding together power and peace. There's often this weird thing that happens when Christians, especially American Christians in this day and age, think about the second coming, which is that they seem to almost completely forget about the first coming. And so as they think about the second coming, and it's depicted in popular culture through things like the Left Behind books and movies, what they tend to envision is just a total bloodbath just complete and total carnage and devastation and violence, and in charge of all the violence is Jesus which is so deeply weird. It's just so weird to think that way because Jesus has already shown us in established historical fact what his coming in glory looks like. It looks like this helpless infant born under the brutality of occupation. That is God coming into the world. And we have no reason to think that Jesus' second coming will be of a fundamentally different character or nature from his first. And so to affirm that Jesus Christ will come again in glory or will come with power to judge the living and the dead does not mean affirming that Jesus will come with violence. 
Now, it is true that we have violent depictions of these sorts of things, particularly in the book of Revelation. There is an awful lot of violence in that book. And it has led some people to believe that a a flat or literalistic reading of that would say that Jesus came the first time peacefully, but when he comes back the second time, he's going to be mad. He's going to just take it all out on everybody. All the mistreatment he experienced in the past, he's coming back to set it right and to do so with violence. I heard a story of a man who was traveling in Israel and went and visited an Orthodox monastery. And he sat and he was having tea with the, the priest who was in charge of this monastery. And the priest pointed out the, river and said, you, pointed out the window and said, do you see that valley down there? That's where you're going to be. When Jesus comes back, all of those who are not part of the Orthodox Church, their blood will rush down this valley and saturate everything. That's what Jesus is coming back to do, to save those who are in the Orthodox Church and to violently execute all those who are not. Now, just to be clear, this priest's uh, views are not representative of actual Orthodox teaching, and they're certainly not representative of what we find in Scripture. Well, it is true that the book of Revelation depicts violence, almost always what you see is that it is the Christians who are victims of violence and nonetheless conquer through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of their testimony, through not loving their lives so much as to shrink from death. And even this picture we see in Revelation 18 of Jesus coming and and his robe is soaked in blood, it is not the blood of his enemies or his adversaries. His robe is bloodied long before the conflict actually begins. It It is his own blood already shed at Calvary. The hope of Jesus' second coming is not the hope that Jesus will come and execute violent vengeance on everyone who's not like us. The hope of Jesus' second coming is that Jesus will come exactly the way he came the first time full, as the Gospel of John writes, of grace and truth. And that as Jesus comes with glory in power, Jesus will not resort to violence to establish his desired kingdom. But that through the power of Jesus' own suffering love and through the suffering love of all Jesus' followers, Jesus will set up right here on earth in creation the restoration and renewal of all things. It's pretty easy, I think, in some ways, to focus back on Jesus' first coming. There are comfortable routines and rituals that we experience this time of year that can fill us with great joy, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's beautiful and worth celebrating. But as we think back to Jesus' first coming, we should remember that Jesus' work on earth is not yet finished. And the season of both Advent and Christmas should orient us toward an eager anticipation The time when Jesus will return in earth in the language of the creed, coming in glory to judge the living and the dead. And the promise of God's righteous judgment, God's capacity to make right all that is broken should fill us with joy. It should fill us with awe and wonder for the God who created all things and ultimately will bring all of this creation to its intended purpose. And should fill us with hope that Jesus coming in power means Jesus coming in peace, and that as Jesus comes in peace, all that is broken in this world can be made right by his power as we receive him as our king and celebrate with joy. Would you pray with me? Gracious and merciful God, we give you thanks for the first coming of your son Jesus into the world that we've been celebrating all this month. And we pray, God, that we would have the courage, even in the face of potential embarrassment, to believe with saints throughout history that Jesus Christ will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And we pray that the promise of this advent, of Christ's second coming, would fill us with joy. And we pray this in the precious name of Christ. Amen.